everyone, it's Deanna Guerrero joining you from beautiful San Antonio, Texas. Welcome and thank you for joining me today. Today we're going to continue in our study on putting on the full armor of Christ and today we're going to focus on putting on the helmet of salvation. So, before we get started, I invite you to um, go and get your Bible, press the pause button if you need to, go get your Bible, get something to take some notes with, maybe you have an electronic device that you take notes on, or that you have your Bible application on, so go ahead and do that, and then we're going we're gonna to start, okay? So, let's open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord. Father God, for this day. This is the day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. We just thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for opening our spiritual eyes so that we can see in your word what you would have us to see, to open our spiritual ears so that we can hear your word. We thank you for opening our hearts so that your word will take root into our hearts and that we will become living, living, um, epistles of you and your word. We just thank you, Lord, for your divine revelation that we will receive this day in your word. And we thank you for our salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, let's open our Bibles to Ephesians 6. We're going to get right into this. We've got a lot to cover today, and it is going to be some good stuff. Good time in the word. Ephesians 6, starting in verse 10. I'm going to read from the King James Version, and if I decide to go over to the Amplified Version, I will tell you, okay? So, let's start. And we're going to read through verse 18. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now, um, just as we've talked about each piece of the armor in this series, I'm going to, you know, describe it physically and then how it affects us spiritually. Because we're talking about um, armor that would go on a soldier, and in this case, Paul was using the example of the Roman soldier in those time period in his time period. And so we're going to use that to describe it physically and then I'll cover it spiritually. And you know, just as like the the shield, the shield of faith that we talked about last time, the Roman um, helmets were actually also made of leather. And then it had pieces of, um, it was made of leather, covered their head, and then um, there would maybe be pieces of metal that would come across the top of their head and the temples of, of their, um, their head. So across their forehead and then across their temples would, sometimes they put metal pieces to protect those sensitive places of the head. And... Um, you know, um, looking back, you know, in um, his, historically, I guess, the historical accounts, we learned that during that period of time, the weapons that they used were often fought with clubs. I mean, just think uh, clubs, pieces of chains. Um, so they'd have a piece of chain and just kind of sling it at each other, and that could hit you in the head, and it could just knock you out, you know, or hit you in the head with a club. Um, swords and daggers and so again you know the helmet was to protect the head the physical head um, from the blows in these hand-to-hand -hand combats that they would have when they were fighting and also you know 
the soldiers sometimes rode horses, and if they fell from the horse, then they could get a brain injury or a head injury that, you know, they rendered them helpless. They wouldn't be able to continue fighting. And, you know, just think about how important your head is. You know, when we go bike riding nowadays, normally, I think it's the law that you have to wear um, a helmet. You know, your children have to wear a helmet. It's for safety re reasons, you know. Um, motorcycle um, riders should. I don't think it's a law here in Texas. But they should wear a helmet, you know, because it's so dangerous. But we have to protect our ourselves. Um, they protect our heads. Um, a couple years ago, I took horseback riding lessons. And one of the rules before you could mount up was to you had to wear a riding helmet. So, you know, these helmets are really important. They could save your life. And so when we take, we take the, um, spiritually, we're going to take the helmet of salvation. Um, what we're to do phys um, spiritually when we do that is to remind ourselves that we are putting on our salvation. We're reminding ourselves that we have a helmet of salvation because of Jesus. Jesus is our salvation because what he did on Calvary, he now, we have a now, we now have a spiritual covering over our head. Jesus is our, our savior. He protects our heads. You know, he protects our minds in battle. Um, and we're, we're to remember what he has done for us. When we think about salvation, you know, normally whenever I think of salvation, I'll just automatically think of the cross. And I guess it's just because that's just one of the things that we've always talked about in church. But even if, if you haven't and you're new, um, you're a new believer, just, you know, when you hear the word salvation or that Jesus is your Savior, just remember that he, what he did for you so that you could have salvation, so that you could go to heaven, so that you could have eternal life, that you are not doomed to eternal salvation because of what Jesus did, that he died on the cross for you, that he went down to hell and took back our salvation. Amen. So Jesus, he protects our heads in battle. We're to remember what he's done for us and, and not just remember it, but also to share it with others. Share your testimony of what, how Jesus, how God has changed your life, excuse me, has changed your life so that they'll know that salvation's available to them as well. Not just to you, you know, salvation's are available to all of us. Now, here in um, Ephesians, in um, the 17th verse, you know, he's not just talking about our initial acceptance of Jesus as our Savior. It starts there, but then it goes on. And it goes on to talk about how, um, or it actually cover, it doesn't talk about it here, it just starts there. But then it goes on to cover, so the um, your helmet of salvation or your salvation is referring to God's ongoing rescuing and delivering power. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead, once you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, now resides within you. That's that salvation power. Now, it's referring to... Um, the rescuing and deliverance from all kinds of evil. You know, up here we had read that um, the evil day is coming. Well, this salvation, this helmet of salvation, is going to help protect you against the evil day, against all kinds of evil, both temporal, which is temporary, things that can happen here on this earth, but also eternal, from eternal damnation, right? Because now we're, we, we're going to be um, in heaven with God. We once our time here on earth is gone, you know, we're not going down to the fiery depths of hell. We have eternal salvation. So it also means that right now, in this time, that that salvation is going to pardon us. And a pardon means that, you know, you're wiped clean. The sentence that was upon you, your guilty sentence has been put aside. And to restore you. And it also promises healing healing in your body, wholeness in your body, your spirit, soul, and mind, and complete soundness, spirit, soul, and body. Amen. 
Isn't that good? Now picture this. I want you to picture this. So you have the helmet on your head. You have your helmet of salvation. And this um, helmet protects the head. It protects the brain. It protects the mind. And as we've discussed previously throughout this series, you know, the real battle is in the mind. The battlefield is in the mind. And so you must, can't emphasize this enough, you must protect your thought life. Protect what you're thinking about. Protect your mind. The enemy is constantly trying to distract you. He wants you to think, um, bad things. He doesn't want you to think about the saving power of God. He wants you to think about how bad things are, how terrible this, these things that are going on around you, how um, impossible the situation looks like. But that's not what God tells you to think on. The, the enemy's trying to get you to think about everything that's going on around you except for God and the things of God. And maybe even from listening to this, maybe you're distracted. Maybe something I've said has distracted you and you're like, you know, but come back, come back, come back and listen to what God's talking to you about. You know, when you drive down the street, maybe you have a CD or you have um, some Christian music on and um, you're really listening to it. And then all of a sudden you see a bumper sticker and that distracts you. Or you look up and you see a billboard, you know, and um, all around you, you know, there are distractions. When you're in the car, there's music lyrics. When you're um, walking through a store, you know, you, you may see something, you know, that takes your, some advertisement, takes your, your mind off of what you were thinking about, what God was putting in your mind. Um, television, you know, commercials. Um, it's trying to distract you from from the things of God and what God is doing in your life and that God is your salvation and that he wants you focused on him and how to share that with others and how to live um, life for him. And, you know, it, it's just all around us. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, let's say that you're on a diet or maybe you're even fasting, you know, and you're, you're doing these things because you, you are wanting, okay, let's just go with the diet because I think that's more common. Let's just say that you're on a diet and, you know, you know you need to lose weight. You know, maybe it's for health reasons. Maybe it's just so you'll feel better about yourself or maybe your doctors advised you to and you're doing really good. You're exercising, you're watching your caloric intake, eating healthy, and then, um, you know, you've done really well all day and you go and you're watching, say, I'm going to watch some TV. You turn on the TV and every commercial is fast food and this food and that food that you know you shouldn't be eating. And so then it rises up that temptation. And so then before you know it, that's all that you can think about is the food on the screen. You know, that is the enemy distracting you from what God has called you to do. And in this instance, you know, maybe it's, you know, to lose that weight for your own um, well-being and for the health of your family, right? So he's trying to distract you. The enemy is trying to distract you, and he attacks you in your mind. And he does it. He'll do it through your ear gates. These eyes are gates into your soul. He'll do it through your, your ears as well. So you really have to protect your mind. Um, you have to do it. You have to protect it. You know, in the world, they're always saying that you have to save yourself. They don't talk about Jesus being your Savior. They don't want to hear about Jesus being your Savior or that Jesus is your salvation. They want you to, to believe that you have to look out for number one because nobody else is going to do it. Surely you've heard that. But, you know, that's the opposite of what God teaches us in his word. Um, God, God's word actually tells us the opposite. In 1 Timothy um, 4, verse 10, it says, We trust in the living God who is the Savior. Right? So just repeat that after me. I trust in the living God who is my Savior. Okay? Now, in um, Psalms 91, this is one of my all-time favorite chapters in the Bible. I've known it since I was a little girl, and even when I wasn't really living for Christ, I always would go back to that passage of Scripture. Didn't necessarily understand it. In fact, I didn't understand it, but I just knew there was something about that Scripture that if I needed help, I could read it and 
somehow God was going to help me. And you know what? He always did. I believe that God takes you where you are and he honors that word that is in you or that you are speaking, whether you understand it or not. We do want to get understanding of the word, but he'll take you where you are because he is our savior. You know, Psalms 91 reminds us what our salvation includes. And I'm going to summarize it quickly and then I'll go through it a little bit um, deeper. And to summarize, it tells us that God promises to protect us from danger. From danger. I always knew when I was a little girl, if I was in danger or even as a young adult, to read this. You know, whatever it was, if I was in a difficult situation, I would read this. If I was scared and home alone at night, I would read this out loud and it would work. It says that we'll be delivered here in this passage of scripture from pestilence. Now, we don't really use pestilence so much these days, but pestilence would mean sickness and disease. It means famine. It means earthquake and other um, natural calamities that come against us. But listen to this. It also says that we'll be protected from sudden death that comes by the weapons of men. You know, weapons of men could be you sitting in a movie theater and somebody coming in and start shooting. Maybe you're in a mall and somebody starts shooting. This, off, this gives us protection from that. And you're like, oh, those are words, lady. You are crazy. No, this works. I'm telling you, I wouldn't take a chance on it. It works. It works better than any other. This spiritual armor that I'm telling you about works better than any physical armor that you could put on. Now, it goes on to promise us a long, satisfying life. At the end of this chapter, it says, And I will satisfy you with long life and show you my salvation. <laughs> and, and it also promises deliverance from every kind of evil that comes our way. And remember, we read earlier in this verse, or in this um, passage of scriptures in Ephesians 6, that the evil day is coming. But he's saying here in Psalms 91, that he's going to deliver us from every kind of trouble that comes our way. It doesn't say that we, we're we not going to face trouble. Oh, no, we're going to face some trouble. We're on this earth. But he's going to deliver us. He's going to deliver us. And aren't these wonderful promises? Aren't they wonderful? Don't you want them for your own? You know, this is what salvation entitles you to. The helmet of salvation entitles you to this. But, you know, unfortunately, it doesn't just operate on its own. You have to do something about it. It doesn't op automatically happen. Um, these promises from Psalms 91 and the rest of the Word, um, the rest of the promises in the Word of God, they operate under specific conditions. And these conditions will help you to put on the helmet of salvation, to hold up your, sh your shield of faith, your breastplate of righteousness, your belt of truth, and have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Amen. So we're going to, um, we're, we're, now we're going to talk about the first condition. I'm just going to give you two conditions um, that this salvation offers us from Psalms 91. So turn in your Bibles um, to Psalms 91. And in Psalms 91, 1, verse 1, it says, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Okay, so who dwells in the secret place of the Most High? Well, we do. We choose to abide under the in the, in the secret place of the Most High under the shadow of the Almighty. So we see here, from this passage of scripture, that there is an abiding in the Lord, an abiding in the Lord, or staying consistently close to Him. Now, you do this by putting God and His Word first place in your life. You know, over and over again in the Bible, it tells us, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first. You know, the word seek is a scriptural word, and it means to go after with intense effort. So it's going to take some effort on your part. You're going to have to exert. You're going to have to exert some consistent effort if you want to experience the fullness of your salvation. Don't you want these things that I'm talking to you about? So let's take a closer look <laughs> at the word abide, and you'll see how you can do this now. You know, um, the word abide is um, derived, I guess, or from the word abode, which means house, right? So it means to dwell to remain fixed in a certain place. So if you abide somewhere, that's where you live. 
you're going to spend most of your time thinking on the word, reading the word, putting it in your mouth, speaking it out of your mouth, putting it in your heart. Um, you want to be familiar with God's promises and his word so that they live in you. In John 15, 7, Jesus says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, so you abide in them and they abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. If you abide, you make that decision. Now, personally, me personally, I found that if I'll spend, you know, some time in the Word of God every day, that when I'm facing some situation, this Word of the God will well up within me, and it'll tell me what to do. It, I just have to do it a little bit every day, and then this Word will start to rise up within me. It will start to speak to my heart continually. It starts telling me what to do. It starts shining light in those areas of my life where I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do in this situation or this circumstance. And then I'm just here and I'm reading the Word of God and then it comes to me. That's what that means. That's what I'm supposed to do in that situation. It'll come up within you. Sometimes the Word's not even within you and you're facing a situation you're like, Lord, show me what to do. And it just comes up. Sometimes you don't even have to ask. It's just there because you fed it. Now believe me, when this happens, it is a good thing. Because sometimes I've almost been like <gasps> panicking and then it came to me and I was like, oh. And it was like, no fear. No fear here. The word is in here. Oh, I like that. No fear here. The word is in here. And the word just overtakes it and the fear has to leave. I know what to do. When you when that battle, when that battle is upon you, when that trouble is here, when it's knocking on your door, it's knocking. That abiding word of God, when it is in you, the word that you've been feeding into your spirit, you've been putting into you, when it rises up within you, like I'm talking about, and it tells you what to do, you'll be so glad that you took the time, that you weren't lazy, that you took the time to put this word in your eyes, to read it, to study it, to listen to it in your car, to listen to me, and to make it your dwelling place, that that's where you dwell. Because it says, if you abide, if you abide, and if it abides in you, that is a dwelling place. That's a home. Its home is in you. And if the word of God is in you, it chases out the fear. Amen? So when the enemy comes knocking, you're not scared. You have the word that's going to answer. Answer the door for you. The word is going to go to the door. Trouble's knocking. The word answers. Amen? Isn't that good stuff? <laughs> Praise God. Now, the second play, way to, to keep yourself in line to experience the fullness of this salvation, of putting on the, the helmet of salvation, or, you know, to take on the, sal the, the helmet of salvation, is found in Psalms 91 too. And it says, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him will I trust. You know, so according to this passage, you have to give God the authority um, to act in your life by trusting Him with your heart, first with your heart, and then speaking words of faith with your mouth. Okay? So first you're going to trust Him with your heart, and you're going to put the Word of God in there. That's how you trust Him with your heart. And then you're going to speak it out of your mouth. And that's when you give God the authority to, to act in your, in your life. You know, Jesus taught us this exact principle in Mark eleven twenty three. Let's turn there. Mark eleven twenty three. This is a foundation scripture that we should all know. For verily I say unto you. Let's start in 22. It says, have faith in God. <laughs> For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall now not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. 
Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. The devil, the evil one, he knows the truth of these words. And that's why he's always after your words. He's always trying to trip you up with your words. He tries you to get you to speak words of fear and doubt. He'll try to get you to speak about how bad things are. He'll try to get you to speak about how bad your marriage is, how terrible you feel, how you are sick, that you always get sick at this time of, of year, how broke you are, how terrible your children are. But I'm telling you, don't do it. Don't speak those words of fear and doubt. No, no, no. You have to learn the vocabulary of silence. Just zip it up. If you, you have to go back to what your mother taught you in this instance, right? Where mother said that if you can't say something nice, then don't say anything at all. And that's what the Bible is basically saying. If you can't say something, if you can't say the word, then don't say anything at all. Until you can speak the word to that situation that you're facing, don't speak anything at all, okay? You have to get the word in you dwelling so it comes up and it answers it answers when troubles knocking when the battle is there the word goes and fights that battle for you so you want to be able to say what mark 11 23 and 24 says you want to say what god says about this situation that you're facing what god is saying about that circumstance you want to say what god says about your body that your body is healed that by his stripes you are healed that he sent his word and that he healed you that your family is serving the lord um, you want to be able to say what God says about your finances, that you're blessed going in and blessed coming out, that Abraham's blessings are yours. Now remember, those are just a couple of, um, inst um, I guess, um, examples, you know, that you can speak to the circumstances and that's a way of keeping your helmet of salvation on because this is where the battle is. And you need to keep your helmet of salvation on it securely so that you win the battle and it doesn't come toppling off and then your head is not protected. And that's the purpose of speaking God's word is it keeps your helmet on. Speaking God's word, keeping God's word going in your eyes and your ears, coming out of your mouth, keeps your helmet securely fastened upon your head, protecting your thought life. Now, Remember, as you take up um, your helmet of salvation, I want you to remember that the most important part about putting on your helmet of salvation is that Jesus is your Savior. His work in us is salvation. You just listening to this, you know, you need to remember that His work in you is salvation. It is a part of His redemptive work of giving you salvation. Um, nobody can monitor your thinking. Nobody. God has given you a free mind, a free spirit, a free will. You choose what you're going to think about. But you, you can control what you dwell on in your mind. And that's what I want you to get from this. You have the power to, dim, to dismiss thoughts or you have the power of what Things you're going to entertain in your mind, what you're going to put in your when your thoughts, what thoughts you're going to entertain. Now, again, one of the most important things to remember and to think on is the truth that just say this: Jesus is my savior. Jesus is my savior. Okay. I I read a, a story about this young woman who was mugged on a city street, and she was actually on the verge of being um, raped at at knife point. And um, during this time, she just kept saying repeatedly to herself and out loud to her assailant, Jesus is my Savior, Jesus is my Savior, Jesus is my Savior. And she just kept repeating that. And the attacker, he became so um, troubled, he, it bothered him so much that he eventually just dropped the knife and ran off. He, he ran away from her and he's the one that had the knife. But because she kept saying she was 
she just hooked on to that. Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my Savior. And he ran off. And I believe that as we do that, sometimes I just say it. Jesus, I thank you that you're my Savior. And I'll just speak to the circumstance. Jesus is my Savior. You know? And I don't know what happens spiritually, but I know it works. I'm not, I can't see spiritually what is what it's actually doing, what bondages it's breaking, what, what, um, chain maybe or club was gonna hit me in the head of my helmet of salvation but I say Jesus is my savior and it falls flat you know this this statement I'm not gonna pretend that it's a magic formula because it's not but it is a declaration of truth it's a declaration of truth and I want you to remember that um, when this young lady said that this was the word abiding within her and when she spoke it in faith she was trusting God that it was so. And you know what? It was. It was so. I want you to say it again. Jesus is our Savior. Hallelujah. And I just, I'm going to close in prayer. I thank you, dear Heavenly Father, that you sent our Lord Jesus and that Jesus is our Savior. I thank you that every man, woman, and child that will listen to this will receive salvation from you and know that there is no salvation available to man but through our Lord Jesus Christ and we put on our helmet of salvation and we say that Jesus is our Savior in Jesus name amen now next time we're going to talk about the sword of the Spirit so I thank you for joining me. I encourage you to share this broadcast with all your friends and all of those that you think would be blessed by it. Um, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and um, just like my um, program so that others will also get to hear the good news of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And until next time, be blessed.